So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for jumping on the Network Mind Out webinar today. Um, before we start, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land that we're all meeting across the country today. I'm here uh, on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation and our fabulous guests today are on the land of the Wajak people and the Noongar Nation all the way over on the west side. Um, so thank you so much for being here and taking the time out of busy schedules to hear the webinar and also to present. Um, I'm Charlie. I work here on the Mind Out project at the National LGBTI Health Alliance and as part of this I'll be hosting the webinar today. Today we have two fabulous presenters. We have Sandra Norman and Janie Shah from Living Proud. Uh, Sandra has been running LGBTI inclusivity training for Living Proud for 14 years and also spent 12 years as a volunteer on the telephone counselling line. Her, work with, her other work involves the intersections of sexuality and disability. And joining Sandra, we have Janie, who is a psychotherapist and has been working in the field of sex, sexuality and gender for the past six years. Uh, they currently are working at Living Proud as a senior counsellor and look after the Q Life project for WA. And today they'll be doing a presentation on staying strong when listening to homophobia and transphobia is your job. Now, just remind you all, there is a chat function down the bottom for those of you on computers that will enable you to type in any questions or comments you have throughout the presentation. And our presenters will be looking at that throughout. Um, so thank you, Sandra and Janie. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we get started? Yeah. So um, we've obviously got the title there. And oh, let's just... Uh, so Charlie kind of introduced us a bit already, but we just wanted to talk a little bit about, I mean, this presentation is all about the, the specific stresses of working in the community, in the, in the queer community as a peer. So we just wanted to talk about our background there. Um, so I've been working for Living Proud for about 19 years and the last 15 or so of those, uh, my main job has been running LGBTI uh, inclusivity training. Um, and then also I did volunteer on the telephone counselling line for about 12 years as well as um, obviously as a peer counsellor there. Um, yeah, I've been with Living Proud for about four years now, working um, on the Feel Life lines and I'm the senior counsellor. Um, I'm also a psychotherapist and do private practice as well. Yeah. Um, so the idea for this presentation came about from a whole lot of conversations that initially started when we were, you know, in, in the throes of the marriage equality debate. Um, and even though that debate has died down, there's been obviously similar conversations over the you know, last couple of years about things like trans inclusion in sport and now the religious freedom debate, where we're just kind of bombarded with messages um, at, at work and also at home, um, where you know our identities are a matter of, of, of public discourse. So, um, one of the things that we noticed uh, when these debates have been going on is that you know through social media and things like that, a lot of people are putting up ideas for how to look after yourselves in the middle of those debates, and a lot of the ideas look something like this. Um, so it's a lot of suggestions that the thing to do is to step away, to take breaks, to you know stop reading your Facebook feed or don't read the comments or walk away from the debate and, and, and don't engage with it. Um, but we found that that wasn't necessarily very easy advice for someone whose job it is to actually have those conversations. So, um, you know, each of us in our roles has, have found that, that whatever is happening in, in that public debate is being brought up either in workshops or in counselling sessions and people expect us to be across these issues and to really um, have a good understanding of the latest news story or the latest comments that, that are being made. So it was much harder for us to distance ourselves in that way or, or to, to escape um, having those, those conversations or reading, engaging with, with all that information. Yeah, there was a lot of, just following on from that, expectations or assumptions that we did know what was going on and were willing and open to have those discussions back with people. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
the other thing that we really noticed is the difference between being an educator or counsellor, you know, being in, in, in that kind of role versus being an activist. Um, and often, you know, we were both in, in different times or different parts of our lives. We might still have an activist role on the weekends or, or whatever. But when it's your job to be, you know, a, an, an educator or a counsellor or something like that, you have to take a very different approach to it. So one of the, the thing that we noticed is that when you're in an activist role, you have the luxury of being able to get angry about things and expressing that anger, um, whether that's just as a keyboard warrior or at a rally or, or whatever, you, you can, you, you have that outlet. Um, but when you're in a role as an educator or a counselor, you have to find a different, you have to find different strategies. Um, you can't, well, for one thing you can't avoid the conversations because it's your job to actually encourage people to express their most homophobic or transphobic or, or whatever discriminatory beliefs because you know unless they're expressing them then you can't address those issues so not only did you have to let them say these things you actually had to encourage them to say those things and, and keep smiling at them and not get angry um, and it's not enough to just kind of force the anger down because that's obviously not healthy there's been interesting studies recently showing that people who are forced to smile all day for their job actually have you know higher rates of alcohol use and things like that we know it's not not healthy to just shove the anger down so you actually have to find different strategies to avoid getting angry in the first place um, and different ways of, of coping with uh, with those situations okay so we started talking through how we managed it in in each of our different kind of work roles um, what kind of strategies we put in place to look after ourselves when, when we were not only, you know, hearing these things, but having to encourage um, these kinds of conversations. So we've got a couple of different ideas here, um, starting with a bunch of uh, intellectual strategies. So we're just kind of going to, going to go through these one at a time. The first one is respect is, it's an idea that I came across, I, I wish I could remember who to attribute this to but I was uh, at a workshop where somebody said that the approach he took with every interaction with um, another person was always to, to ask himself the question the question how can I demonstrate my respect to this person um, so it's it's about not only feeling respect but actually demonstrating it actively in some way which is a really interesting thing. I think we used to have a lot more formal processes in our society, you know, as we've got in our little picture here, the, the bowing, the, the, the doffing your hat kind of thing, um, using people's titles and things like that. But all of that has changed. And Australia is a very informal kind of country. So uh, what is it we can do to demonstrate respect, um, whether that's about smiling at people, shaking their hands, remembering to use their preferred name, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, but it's an interesting mental habit to get into because it shifts your perspective uh, into always thinking about what you can give or what, what do other people need from you in that moment. Yeah, and it's also about what support they're looking for or um, why, in terms of QLife, why have they contacted us today? I've been curious about that as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in, in a workshop perspective, it's about, um, I guess, uh, rather than being on the defensive and, and, and worried about what people are going to say, always sort of thinking about it in terms of what, what I can give in, in the interaction. Um, the second point about unconditional positive regard probably is more from a counselling perspective. Yeah, so in terms of counselling, just thinking about the person as being a human being rather than someone who is trying to rile you up. Um, but also respecting them as in that process as well. So just thinking about unconditional positive regard and how you're going to support that person in that particular setting or in that moment. Yeah. yeah. And I think similarly for me, it's about separating the person from the behaviour. So mm -hmm. respecting them as a human being, even if you don't necessarily respect the opinion or the behaviour or whatever it is that, that they're, they're saying at that moment. Um, compassion is about not just reacting to the behaviour, but trying to understand why they're behaving the way they are. So exploring that, um, exploring the backstory. Yeah, and again, the same for counselling, looking at why they've come in to contact us and what's going on for them in that moment and what can we do to support them um, 
without getting too involved in kind of the process of our own feelings around that as well. Yeah, so having having compassion for their struggle, so trying to see it from that perspective, if they if they are saying things that, that are upsetting in some ways, trying to find compassion uh, for their situation, which for me leads directly into generous assumptions. This is one of the biggest strategies that I use um, to kind of maintain my cool in, in workshops and things is, is making generous assumptions about why people are saying the things that they are. So, um, you know, if, if somebody says something homophobic, I will start by assuming that that's being said out of ignorance rather than out of malice. Um, so just trying to, trying to put the best possible <laughs> interpretation that I can um, on, on the things that are being said and, and uh, yeah, being, I find being generous in that way, uh, it, even if it's not correct, even if my assumptions aren't correct, believing that they are is what helps me uh, maintain, you know, a, a positive relationship uh, through that interaction. Yeah, so having a listening ear, I think, is a really good generous assumption, just kind of sitting with that. So thinking about, you know, why are they coming and venting to us? Are they feeling hurt? What's happening for them? Um, but also a good reason why they're saying what they're saying. So try to get under the layers and assuming that there are more layers to get under as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, distancing, I've got with a question mark because it's, you know, it, it's a strategy that sometimes people use. Um, I, I, I think it's a strategy of, of last resort. I'm not, so, sometimes it's, it's almost the best that you can do for your own self-protection in a particular situation. Um, but you do it at the cost of, of rapport and empathy with that person. So it's not ideal, um, but sometimes it, it, it you know, that, that might be, for whatever reason, uh, ha how you're feeling that day, that might be the best that you can do. Um, so, and it's about not taking it too personally. So it's also about, I think, um, you know, if people are assuming our gender or our race or our sexuality, especially through Q Life, um, because it is an anonymous service. So thinking about distancing, but still being empathic while we're distancing and kind of supporting that individual. So do we put our things to the side and then deal with that after and debrief that? Or, you know, how do we kind of work through that process? And then uh, recognising the limits of control. So what is your responsibility and what is their responsibility? So uh, with the people I'm running training with, you know, like with, with the, with my training team, I always say that your responsibility is to present the information as well as you can, as, as well as you can. It's not your responsibility to make them change their mind or make them change their behavior or even listen to you like that. That's their responsibility. It's their, it's their choice whether or not they take the information on board. Your, your responsibility is just to present it. And similar for us, you know, it's in terms of um, what our service can provide. So we're here to listen and support, but it's also not about changing their views. Um, yeah, in particular, it's more about just kind of providing that ongoing support, sorry, that short-term support and then providing ongoing referrals for them to access. Yeah. yeah. So all of those intellectual strategies require a high degree of self-regulation, um, which can be more difficult if you're hungry and tired and flustered. Um, so in order to put any of these into practice, they need to be supported by logistical strategies as well. So we just wanted to talk through some some of those things um, for me that a lot of that is around a lot of careful planning around the workshops that I'm providing and that planning can take place quite a, a long way in advance um, so I plan I plan the night before a workshop I plan what I'm doing the morning of the workshop um, I sort of try to prepare myself uh, mentally physically organizationally um, I have a whole heap of rules around you know, getting a good night's sleep the night before, having high protein breakfast, not having any any sugar, like making sure I've got healthy snacks, um, getting to the to the venue early to set up so that I'm not flustered and I can sort out any IT problems. I can check in with my co-facilitator about how they're feeling. Um, all of those kinds of things, uh, practical things that are going to hopefully make the day run a bit smoother and put me in the best state of mind to then self-regulate and, and, and apply all those other strategies. And for me, it's more about the environment because the contacts we have are anonymous. It's not, you can't really prepare how you're gonna to respond to that as much, but it's more about the environment you have. So, you know, making sure that you kind of 
you've got your tea with you for the morning or setting up your computer in your space how you like it um, but also the morning of before shift just making sure that you know you do have a good breakfast so you make sure if you do watch news in the morning or tv or radio you do something else as well um, the day before it's more about kind of setting up for the next day so maybe writing out all your notes in terms of debriefing things like that um, but also not rushing into work so making sure you have some time to relax before actually getting to work whatever that looks like for you um, and at night same as Sandra getting an early night and a healthy dinner yeah all those things yeah Taking breaks after difficult chats and calls is probably more you. Yeah, so that one I think kind of goes into the same. So it's more about looking after ourselves and when we've parked something to the side, kind of debriefing that. So whether that looks like taking a break physically in terms of getting some fresh air, going for a walk, or does it look like um, debriefing or using on call? So just thinking about what works for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ego depletion is something I think about a lot. So. Uh, it's part, it's this idea that willpower, self-control and self-regulation become reduced throughout the day. And, and part of that is uh, the recognition that complex thinking tasks actually deplete us physically. Um, you know, when, when they've done uh, experiments, they've shown that giving people complex cognitive tasks actually makes their, drop, their blood sugar drop. So uh, that can be a bit of a surprise um, for people, I think, if, if they're new to the doing the sort of training work um, because tra training work does get very complex. I know that, that often it's about um, sort of parallel processes taking place that uh, sort of one part of your mind is thinking about or well, trying to remember and, and deliver as well as possible um, eight hours of very complicated and nuanced information while editing that information on the fly for the particular audience. So taking into account who's in the room and <clears throat> what, what examples are going to be relevant for their work and do you need to make it easier or harder, you know, more challenging depending on how they're responding to all the material. So you've sort of got all of that going on. And the other part of your brain is trying to pay attention to the group dynamics and is somebody dominating, is somebody looking uncomfortable, um, what are their emotional responses to the things you're talking about? Because often we're talking about quite difficult things. We might be talking about you know, suicide or that sort of thing. So how are they all handling that information? And particularly for any LGBTI identified people in the room, are they responding to the things, to remarks that other people are saying? And then also, how am I responding as a peer to the, the remarks that are being said in the room and also checking with my, checking in on my co-facilitator, you know, do they look like they're getting upset by things that are being said? So trying to manage all of that at the same time as delivering all of the, the, the content as well. Um, and as I said, it can be eight hours really without any kind of break because the break times, the morning teas and the, the, the lunches, those are the times when participants will come to you and disclose personal things that are too hard for them to say in front of the group. So you, then you're, you're doing the accidental counsellor role and trying to manage all of that as well in your breaks. So it can be absolutely physically exhausting. And often, um, you know, at the end of a, a day of training, I, I'll be aching all over it. it. It's quite a surprise if you're not expecting it. So understanding that that's going to happen and, and preparing for it is, is a really useful thing to do. And then, you know, trying to have some strategies to, to manage your, your health and well-being after a, a day of training is, is really helpful. Yeah, we, so in terms of the same thing around the blood sugar and feeling that like a drain of energy, <laughs> it's really about holding that person's content that they've come to you with, but also your own responses and reactions to that. Um, and so some of the ways we've kind of talked about working through that is kind of you know, the healthy snacks, um, lots of water, making sure you rest your eyes because we're looking at computer screens all day and kind of actively looking at them and that can kind of drain out your eyes a little bit as well. So getting some fresh air, um, but also just writing out your, your counseling notes and then using reflective tools to think about what um, you might have done well within that, but also what you'd like to explore further. Yeah. Recognising your triggers is, I mean, that's specific to doing peer work. Um, the, the things that are being said are going to be quite personal for you a lot of the time. So knowing what, what all those hot button uh, topics are for you. And in my case, also knowing what they are for my co-facilitator. So 
having plans for how to respond to, you know, if a particular topic comes up. Um, one of the things, I mean, for me, this, this flows into co-facilitation because one of the things that I will usually do at the beginning of a workshop is, is check in with a co my co-facilitator and, and know what, what are their triggers as well. And sometimes even to the extent of actually having a code word that we can use that just means, you know, I'm about to lose the plot here and I need you to take over so that I can, you know, step out of the room and take a break or whatever so that we can, we, we know what's going to upset either ourselves or the other person and we can sort of manage the facilitation between us that way. Um, in terms of triggers, so what can counsellors do? Can park them to the side if possible. Um, know how to manage our triggers and where our limits and boundaries sit. And then is it in the best interest for ourselves or that contact to terminate that call or chat, you know? Is it something that's starting to be aggressive or abusive? Do we need to end that? And then definitely on call and debrief as well. And similar for me, that goes into the kind of ratified staff available kind of, you know, who is available that you can talk to and debrief with right then and there. We have on call as well, but checking in before someone comes in for shift um, and just seeing how their day has been, you know, if anything has happened during the day that might kind of trigger them, um, but also being self-aware and communicating with your teammates. Um, and then lastly, we've just got breathing there, obviously, just sometimes the most you can do is get through one breath at a time. One of the things that we didn't put on the list here, but um, I, I thought about afterwards is uh, a technique that, that we train all of our volunteer counsellors in and that I certainly use a lot is the mood meter, which is um, it's a, a technique technique from the Yale Centre for Emotional Intelligence. And so this is a, about a way of um, checking in with yourself about what your current emotional state is and if there's anything you need to do about that. So it's about asking yourself the questions about is my current, is my current emotional state pleasant or unpleasant in my energy level, high or low? And then, <clears throat> then going through um, sort of a series of kind of questions uh, or, or steps to think about if you need to regulate your mood in any way. So they, they use an acronym called RULER, which stands for Recognise, Understand, Label, Express and Regulate. So that can be useful firstly to check in so that you understand what's going on for you and, um, and if you need to do anything to, to, to regulate your mood, but then also just so that you've got a better understanding of, uh, I guess, what's your stuff and what's other people's stuff. So you, you don't misattribute um, your emotional state to something that's being said by a participant or a counsel, mm. you know, counselling client. Nothing else I want to say to that? All right, so self-care, big topic. Yeah. Um, so self-care is obviously, you know, the, the word gets, you know, the phrase gets bandied about a lot and can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, we run a different kind of workshop where one of the things we talk about is self-care. And when you ask people to sort of give you examples of self-care, they're often giving you quite uh, glamorous examples. Like they might talk about sort of retail therapy or going to have a massage or having a bubble bath with a glass of champagne or something. And so I think sometimes there's, there's a limited understanding of what self-care is, and which is why we absolutely love uh, the, this, this work here, the, the boring self-care. Do, do you remember who... It was Daisy someone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we love this idea of, of boring self-care, that self-care can be a whole lot of very unglamorous things. It can be just, uh, you know, doing your laundry and taking your meds and, and like keeping your life, you know, or, ordered and organised in some ways. And this also relates to the idea of um, the difference between short-term self-care and long-term self-care, which I think people don't necessarily... Uh, or I think they confuse a bit. So a lot of the um, examples people give us of self-care are things that are great in the short term, but not necessarily good in the long term. And important self-care topic, you know, self-care strategies might actually be really unpleasant in the short term. Like, you know, going to the dentist is important self-care, but it can be really horrible in the short term, but it's so important for your long-term health. Whereas other things like, you know, eating a chocolate bar might be great in the short term, but if that's always your go-to strategy, that's not going to be so good in the long term. So it's about um, understanding the difference and, and, and having a balance. Like sometimes, sometimes you do need immediate <laughs> gratification. You need something that's just going to make you feel good right now. 
um, but understanding that you need to balance those short-term strategies with the longer term, um, sometimes less glamorous self-care. Mm. I didn't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then as well as that idea of understanding that self-care isn't always glamorous and that there can be a difference between long-term and self-care, long-term and short-term self-care, there's also sort of different domains of self-care. So it's it's good to kind of keep an eye across all those different domains because sometimes people just kind of have a couple of strategies that they go to all the time and they're not necessarily keeping an eye on, on, on all the different areas of their life that they need to you know manage and, and have ticking over nicely. Um, so this is an image that was shared recently, I think on one of the, the queer Facebook groups about you know, in, in response to all of the discussions around religious freedom and stuff, uh, people have obviously been sharing a lot of self-care ideas. So this is quite a nice one in terms of, of keeping across the different domains. Um, and then the last thing that we wanted to talk about is around making sure that you have a lot of support available because part of being a peer is recognizing that you need all the same kinds of supports as the people that you're working with and supporting and, and working for, um, that, that you are part of this community. Like in our workshops, we talk a lot about um, mental health statistics, which can be, you know, a, a little bit uh, difficult for um, LGBTI people. So recognizing that you're part of that community that's experiencing a lot of mental health difficulties means you need to be very careful around provide, you know, making sure you've got a lot of, lot of support in place. Um, so debriefing, I, I think it probably applies equally to both of us. Certainly we, we one of the, the things, one of the reasons that we co-facilitate workshops is so that we can have someone there to debrief with um, at the end of the day and, and, and talk through both how the actual work went, but also how we're feeling about it. Mm. We not so much have a co-facilitator, <laughs> <laughs> but um, for us, we have um, debrief with the other staff or we have supervision. So it's something that you can either hold and then call on call and have a chat with them about, or we have monthly supervision where you can do that debrief. The other way we can kind of do that is by writing out our contact logs um, and just debrief, debriefing what we've heard or spoken about. And that can be quite therapeutic in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes in, in a peer educator role, you might also have access to supervision. I have for some projects and not others, um, but that can certainly be useful. Crisis support, obviously, um, therapy and, 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 you know, EAPs and, and all of those sorts of things. Make, make sure that you're actually taking advantage of all the supports that are being made available for you, particularly because I think for QLife, it, it's quite difficult because if you're mm. part of QLife, you can't access QLife. Yeah. Um, so one of the main forms of support that we recommend to the community is actually cut off. Um, and yeah, and I think then it's really important that you have external and individual therapy or supervision. So it's kind of separated from your workplace, whether it is a queer or non-queer workspace, so that you have that space where you can just talk about anything you need to talk about. Yep. And then general support. So partners and pets and, and community. That, that was something I really noticed a lot during during all the marriage equality stuff that, that even if you didn't personally feel sort of politically motivated by by the, 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 the issue of marriage equality, attending community events was a, a nice antidote to all of the, you know, all the rubbish that was in the media and things like that. Just being with your people um, certainly was a very helpful thing. Yeah, and thinking about boundaries around some of that as well, around expectations of attending those rallies and assumptions about um, needing to be there, obligation to be there. So thinking about our own space that we might need and that if we're working in those queer spaces, we might want to be around community, but we might also want to require time as well. Yeah, taking being, being able to take a break from it. And sometimes actually that's yeah. the, the difficulty with partners. If they, if they don't work in that queer space, then they might be more keen to engage in it in their spare time and they might be reading me things from the media or wanting to go to rallies and, and for you, it just feels like work. Mm. Um, so trying to uh, manage that can be a bit tricky. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then talking about, I guess, work roles. So if you are working in a queer space versus a non-queer space, the kind of support you might get if you are working in a queer space or a non-queer space that might be allies, but I think you were saying that it does still feels a little bit different in terms of the support provided. 
Yeah, and I mean, people often have very good intentions, but you can still feel, you know, the odd person out. Yeah. Um, or or the, the, the token, the token queer. Yeah, and thinking about that, um, especially around the marriage equality, celebrating that versus giving us time to process what's actually happened. Yeah, that was something that we definitely noticed that, um, you know, when, when the vote came out from the marriage equality, uh, you know, plebiscite, uh, I was, I was, I know that I was feeling really emotional and, and quite upset and, and overwhelmed and, and not necessarily in a very happy place, but I was getting all these messages of congratulations from my straight friends uh, and just didn't know how to respond to them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my role is quite isolating here. So I was by myself most of the day, um, which in a way was good. So I could, I had that time to process, but the same thing of getting messages from people congratulating you and you can get married now and that expectation. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you're just, you're not in that, that headspace. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, negotiating, oh, sorry, what else did I have here? So being in a queer space and then having that good support, but also, I guess, negative around, yeah, conversations. People will come into the office and just want to have conversations and assumptions about, you know, we've read X, Y, Z, so we can have this conversation with you. So how do you then manage that as well? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. Did anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask us? Uh, there's a chat box down the bottom for those on the uh, computer if they'd like to ask Janie or Sandra a question. Uh, thanks very much to you both um, for taking the time to present that to us. Um, and it's nice to hear some lived experience that is quite uh, productive and useful when, when, like you were saying, it's hard to hear the negative all the time of what people have been through over that time. So thanks very much for that. Um, just checking the chat. Did anyone else? Uh, have anything they'd like to say. Um, this will be put up on the Alliance Knowledge Hub once the recordings come through and available to be shared um, with colleagues. Um, so, um, if anyone does have any follow-up questions and they do miss out, it looks like uh, Janie and Sandra have their email addresses up there if you'd like to contact them directly. Otherwise, mindout at LGBTI health dot com dot a dot org dot a thanks everyone yeah so do you want to just read that out Janie for those on the phone um so when working for a non-lgbti org in cultural change how can members of the lgbti community navigate using personal stories to create change how can this be balanced with cultural safety we do talk about this a lot and I mean there's, again there's similar issues uh, in, in that counseling role around mm -hmm. um, self-disclosure and how much how you know how, how you manage that um, and I mean I, I, I do use some self-disclosure when I'm running workshops but obviously that that's always negotiated at the time depending on how I'm feeling what kind of vibe I'm getting from the group obviously always with the purpose of the workshop in mind. So I, I only disclose if I feel it's going to be useful to help their understanding. And there's certainly, uh, although I'm, I, I usually make it obvious that I'm a peer, there are certainly, there have been workshops where I have not done that because I just didn't feel safe to do it. Um, so, some, so sometimes I'll deliberately hold back. I've had, I had one workshop where um, a person was really pushing me for self-disclosure more than I was comfortable with. Like they, they wanted to, just hear about my personal coming out story. And I just pushed back about that. I, I, I refused in, in that situation. I just said, you know, for the sake of the workshop, all you need to know is that I'm an LGBTI peer and I just left it there. So it's always about trying to, I mean, I, I had first kind of questioned uh, that, that participant about why they were asking to try and understand if, if it was something I could help with or not, but it just seemed to be, you know, just wanting to, to hear my story for, for, for the sake of it. it. It really wasn't about helping them understand anything. They just wanted me to, to disclose. And I didn't feel like being the entertainment that day. So um, I just put really strong boundaries up around that and said that, you know, I don't owe you my story. Um, 
<laughs> so it's always yeah it, it, it's always an, an ongoing negotiation yeah. and I think for counselors just in general it's more about you know is it going to benefit the client so why are they asking them and being curious about that more than maybe disclosing I mean because we are a peer service if someone does ask specifically how I identify I might say generally you know everyone on this line is LGBTI or they identify LGBTI um, you know but we're all counselors here on Life peer supporters so you know what kind of has brought you here so bringing it back to them and what's going on for them and being curious about why they want to know more about us mm. yeah cool any resources available to support LGBTI workers during this religious freedom scary time? I guess I've just seen things on Facebook, again, mm. very generally around self-care stuff. I haven't seen anything more specific than that. No, I'm the same. I've just seen a lot of self-care material at the moment on Facebook. Yeah, the Alliance also released something with um, Equality Australia and Switchboard as well around self-care. So yeah. um, and it is always turning back at the moment a thing on how do we look after ourselves and each other, um, which is the resources I've seen at the moment as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's one of the ironic things that, you know, we, we feel that impact so strongly because we're, we're experiencing it 24 seven, like it's our work and it's our, our private lives. Uh, so we can't get away from it. And yet in some ways we have less access to support because because we may not be able to access QLife if we're working for QLife. Um, we may not be able to, you know, in my case, I have trouble finding LGBTI friendly counsellors because most of them are people I've trained and it doesn't feel appropriate. I, like I've got a, a professional relationship with them. So trying to find someone I can access for support uh, can be quite tricky. Yeah, you know, I've, been, I've, I've been doing this training for so long. I've, <laughs> I've got professional relationships with almost all the people we yeah. would normally recommend. <laughs> Yeah, so finding that balance of someone who is an ally, but also not so much in the community that you can go and access them. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions from anyone? Looks like people are happy. So I just want to thank everyone for joining again. And thanks again to uh, our presenters, Janie and Sandra. Uh, again, this will be made available on the Alliance website, but thank you both so much for taking the time to speak to us all today. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. See you.